Good morning, everybody. It's our St. Patrick's Day edition of the Future Programming Workgroup. I am recording this. Um, got a couple things to talk about, uh, although uh, one less as of a couple minutes ago. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen Lindsay's email, um, I'll, uh, Lindsay, you can jump in if I misstate anything, but essentially um, the utilities uh, don't want to talk about gross versus net uh, anymore since that was an issue that had already been decided by the work group. Um, but they're happy to continue discuss, uh, discussing uh, that particular issue going forward in the EAG. Did I kind of get that right, Lindsay? Good morning, Your Honors. Yes, I think that's an accurate description. Lindsay okay. North from PHI here. Yes, okay. I concur. All right, thank you, ma'am. So, uh, so that issue's off the table, um, at least from the utilities perspective. Um, we've got uh, to talk a little bit more about Dr. Kowalja's um, analysis that he discussed last week. Hopefully, everyone had an opportunity to look at those numbers a little bit more. Um, and then, uh, we're just going to follow up with the uh, utilities planning cycle. Uh, Taylor was going to give us a, a very short update on that. Uh, hopefully, we can um, put that one to bed as well. And in terms of uh, where we sit with PIMS, uh, the utilities had requested some additional time to respond to everyone's questions. Um, so they are going to provide responses on the 22nd, and then we'll revisit PIMS on the uh, 24th for next week. And hopefully, that will be our last meeting. Um, and Judge Burke and I uh, were, just in terms of the report, Judge Burke and I were talking, and I think what we're going to try and do is send out a good chunk of uh, the a draft of the report to everyone, hopefully by midweek. Um, she has volunteered to go through it one more time uh, before we send it out to everyone. So um, with that, uh, anything else before we get going? Yes, Dylan. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Um, Dylan Vorn, he's with VEIC. Uh, can you, uh, are you going to come back, um, Your Honor, to the to the timetable and sort of review of report and or, or is now a good time to talk about that? You just said midweek a draft report. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to get um, a, a, a very good chunk of the report out to the group for everyone so you can start editing it. Were you talking about turnaround time? Sir? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a good, good, good. That's my main question. Yep. Sure, sure. Um, well, let's look at the calendar. Um, so if we can get it out by like the 22nd or 23rd, maybe, I don't know, is, is a week too short? I mean, we could give you maybe till the 31st or the 1st. I think till that Friday would, would make things a lot easier for OPC. Okay. Sure. Okay. Well, you can, you can add to it, but for myself. Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, and depending on how quickly we can put all the edits together, because that's, um, you know, everybody is going to have different edits on the, probably the same sentence in a lot of cases. So we'll have to, uh, put all the edits in and then read through it again. And hopefully we can get it back out for a second bite at the apple, but I can't guarantee it. Uh, Nicole, yes, ma'am. Yes, good morning. Nicole Zeichner on behalf of OPC. Um, I know that you had stated, Your Honor, that the utilities don't want to further discuss net versus gross, and I understand that. Um, we actually, we didn't write written comments, but we do have a position on that. If I don't know if now's the time or if... Sure. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I mean, yeah, we can still, we can still touch on it. I'm not, okay. I'm not shut, I don't want to shut down discussions completely, but I, I know from their perspective, it's a it's a non-starter. No, and, and we understand that that was discussed previously, but we have reevaluated based on the concerns raised by staff and Joe Loper. And we realize there are pros and cons to setting goals for gross or net. Um, but at the end of the day, we feel that net savings better reflect the impact of programs. They also come with the condition that we must make numerous assumptions about what would have happened without the programs. So we think that a net savings goal is appropriate at this time. And then we agree with Joe's proposal that key parameters be locked in ahead of each program cycle so that the utilities can plan for and execute programs without, without being 
penalized for external factors beyond their control. So we feel like that might address some of their concerns, but just after further consideration, we agree with both staff and Joe Loper on this. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, Jim. Good morning, Your Honor um, and everyone. Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Advocates. And uh, this is a question which you may not have an answer for, but it's about process with the report. <clears throat> and I understand and uh, <clears throat> completely appreciate that you're going to make every effort to in the report to represent those positions, you know, where there's consensus on issues and to reflect where there wasn't consensus and some parties views. But in particular, this issue about net versus gross with the utility saying, yeah, that was decided. We don't want to talk about it anymore. Do you anticipate or do you know if the commission has contemplated whether they will be receptive to comments, public comments, other parties uh, responding to the report? That I have no idea, sir. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I knew, but I, I just, I, I don't. I, I would hope so, but um, in, in a couple of the other work groups that I've done, they have opened it up uh, for, for, for comment after a report has been filed. So but how they'll do it. Oh, Mr. Hurley, he, he's probably a better person to ask, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Dan Hurley with Commission Staff. I think there will be time to comment. I think um, this report's due on April 15th. Normally, the semi-annual comments are also due on April 15th, but I think we're giving an extra week to file our semi-annual comments so that people can incorporate any comments on work reports within their one filing so the commission's not getting you know eight filings from staff and eight filings from OPC and so on. So I think there will be, you know, it's kind of a small time period, but there is at least one week to read this report and then add any comments into your semi-annual comments that are due next week. Uh yes, Lori. Yeah, just um you know the concern that the utility has, and I guess maybe it's um you know, you were saying, is it on the table? Is it off the table? And I had it in front of me, and of course, no, I've lost it. But in our goal structure, we did talk about here it is. As a negotiated position, compromises were made across the goal structure components, and individual components are not severable. So that was the agreement that was made when we filed this in the June time, I think it was the June time frame. So that's more our concern is that we looked at, and everybody looked at everything as an entire package. Everybody was aware that you know everything on it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but that collectively we felt that this was an appropriate position. So should this net gross change, then the goal structure as well as the um, the straw, you know, the, the the resources as well as the straw, which I refer to the bumpers of no more than, no less than, you know, those kinds of things could all be open for discussion again. Um, we may agree to the same things, but we may not because we agree that it was non severable So that's where um, I believe I'm speaking for all the utilities on that. It's not that we're saying, you know, we're just not willing to talk about it. There was a lot of time spent and we had staff, OPC, MEA, the energy advocates, the joint utilities um, were all involved in that negotiated goal structure. Yeah, and, and I got it. I, yeah, I understand there was just um, an agreement on that, and I'm not, I wasn't trying to discount that when I said things are all. Well, I just wanted to say that for behalf of everyone who was not involved, and I wasn't as intimately involved in the discussions as some of the other folks, but the people who were not involved at the time that, you know, it, it was part of a broader agreement and that it, it could change, it could draw that out. It, you know, we may agree on other things, even if that goes away, I don't know, but it does open up that whole um, thing that we filed. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Joe. Oh, I had my cursor on the hand. I didn't know I'd pushed it. Uh, I uh, sounds like we got uh, uh, very divergent views here. Um, there might be compromise positions that we could come up with the, that address the underlying concerns for our recommendation on net savings. Uh, and the main, you know, the main concern about using gross savings was the optics and w that it communicated that things were happening due to the Empower programs that are not happening due to the uh, Empower programs. 
And so, you know, it's possible, uh, you know, there may be some uh, ways, and I think maybe that's why the utilities are pushing it over to the EAG, is that in some ways this could be a reporting, uh, uh, you know, we could evolve the reporting so that it makes it clear, including, you know, on the gross savings table, you know, a big asterisk and then a note, you know, in big font at the bottom that says these are savings uh, that occurred. Uh, they are not savings that were, not all of these savings were caused by the program um, and things like that. And in, I know in our evaluation and verification reports, uh, to the extent that net savings and net to gross ratios are a focus of attention, uh, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, uh, build those up or, you know, make, make those more prominent in our report, in our reports. Um, and staff also could, you know, uh, make that a focal point if if Dan and others wanted. So, so there may be, a, I guess, a, a Judge, I'm just I'm just suggesting there may be some compromises here, uh, so that people, in, in case that's welcomed. Well, I, I think a compromise. I mean, compromises are always welcome, especially if um, you know, as Lori indicated, this was part of a settlement and it was a package. And if you're removing one thing then other things in the settlement are could be technically on the table yeah. the, the, that whole settlement could be blown up um you know if we can get a compromise great but you know the you know the clock's really ticking on this can i ask uh uh if uh jem gravat and uh nicole and others uh who who seem to have it who are taking a, a solid position on this uh, whether you think there would be some room to deal with this on the reporting side, as opposed to the goal specifically. And it, uh, by the way, in some ways it is, uh, it could be advantageous in terms of just reporting because then we report net to gross as it occurs and, you know, right next to the, the utilities achieve their goal. It says, but, you know, the real savings were, you know, 30% or whatever, less than this number. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to respond to Joe's question. If I may, Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Advocates, I'm thinking on my feet. Um, <clears throat> Joe, I mean, I, I think, sure, we're open to talking about it. Um, our position has always been that net would be a better metric. Um, I, I think you're you know, one of the things I think you said in a previous meeting was, you know, the magnitude is what matters. It's it's just an adjustment in, in how you report it in, in some respects. Although I do think it's, you know, a net savings goal <clears throat> could encourage the utilities to put more emphasis on uh, measures and programs where they have more influence, um, which matters to a degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're open, sure. Yeah, to be uh, clear, but I want to be clear that I'm not, my position hasn't changed in terms of what I think is the right answer. I think it's a net savings goal for all the reasons I've laid out. It's just, we, oops, we need compromise here given uh, strong positions that are being taken. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I will say that what I've mostly heard the utilities argument against against net savings is we already agreed on this and we don't want to talk about it anymore, um, which isn't super compelling to me as a, as a rationale for for a decision. But um, you know, th that said, I agree with you, Joe. And yes, we're open to talking about it. Go ahead, Dylan. Thank you, Aaron. Again, Dylan Voorhees with VIC. Um, I'm going to let uh, Nicole really speak to the sort of position, OPC's position on this. Um, I, I would, I would, I would agree with with what Jim's last comment, which is I'm I'm still kind of waiting to hear a, a, an actual reason why what Joe has proposed isn't isn't good, other than we we already talked about this. And having been part of those meetings, Lori, I would say there was. Um, considerably less discussion about net versus gross, but I, I can't obviously can't disagree. There was there was some discussion, and and you know you read from it, and and that's all right. To Joe's question about um, 
communication, I would just say, I, I, I do not think it is a substitute for the structure of the goal, but I absolutely agree that it, that it is always a good idea to improve how this is communicated to the commission and to stakeholders. Net versus gross are not intuitive to most non-experts. And so I think if there's an opportunity here to improve, however the goals are set, to improve communications um, in reporting and, and to the commission about gross versus net, that that is likely going to benefit the commissioners, the quality of decision making and other stakeholders. So um, I certainly think that is worth doing regardless of the outcome on on the structure of the goal. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sheldon. Yeah, I, I do want to agree with what Dylan just said. Uh, it's really communication that matters most on this. Um, but the one thing I wanted to point out, everyone's talking about the difference between a net versus gross goal. But we're also talking about if we had a net goal, fixing the net to gross ratio. And if once you do that in advance, basically they're the same thing. And I hope I don't confuse people, but if you had a net to gross ratio of 70%, and um, to achieve that, you to achieve 70 units net, you have to achieve 100 units gross, and it becomes the same thing. So it's really a matter of optics, what you report. Net is really what the utilities can directly say are attributable to the program. Gross is also what basically statewide you're achieving but in some sense if you have a net to gross uh, net goal with a fixed net to gross ratio you're basically setting a gross goal whether you realize it or not and that's why it's not that crucial to me it's more important as joe more important as joe said it's optics any questions or reactions to that uh, Judge, I, I have a one one short reaction, and that is the one difference uh, I think Sheldon is that uh, you know just over the last since the hit, since the beginning of or so for a long time now we've had a two percent goal gross goal. So most people think we're saving two percent when actually you know at least based on the latest net to gross it's one point three percent. And I, I get concerned even with me with the uh, uh, Maryland Department of Environment and in their analyses, uh, it's not clear to me that they're hip to that and uh and so you know especially you know those kind of now they could be assuming to get two percent a year out of the empower programs which means they don't have to get you know 0.7 percent out of pv or something and so i i uh i i don't and I, I do agree that to the extent we lock it down right which i think is fair and i think everyone has agreed you know uh makes sense in this context that to the extent you lock it down, the two become equivalent in terms of the level of stringency, uh, you know, that the utilities have to achieve. I agree with that. Um, but the uh, but it def but it makes it clear to non initiate, uh, you know, to non experts, you know, what's actually happening from the programs. Well, I think we have to ed educate the non experts. But the the real answer, the problem I have with locking it down, Joe, and we've seen this with lighting is the net to gross ratio if you want accuracy that net to gross ratio over the course of the cycle can change dramatically and we've seen that with lighting so rather than locking it down i prefer a gross goal where you adjust the net to gross in every year and how you report and that's a disadvantage of locking down the net to gross ratio for for goal setting and even reporting okay emily Can you speak, uh, either turn your volume up, we're having a tough time hearing you. Can you hear me now? Uh, it's, you're very faint. I think, I think you're on devices. Yes, that's it. Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay, sorry, I, uh, device issues. Um, I just wanted to echo the point that Joe just made about an, a new consideration, so I'm not arguing one way or the other and OPC has presented its position, but I just wanted to note the importance, increasing importance of making sure that whatever results are achieved through Empower are placed into the context and framework of the state's um, climate goals and greenhouse gas reduction goals. And I think the shift to a greenhouse gas reduction or abatement framework 
supports that and makes it easier to see what the empower contribution is to the overall state goals. So this this issue of what empower programs are actually achieving, what the state is counting on empower to achieve, um, you know, that becomes another dimension of this issue that bears some consideration, I think, in the process. Um, you know, and ultimately, I think the state is concerned with the actual impact on the world of, you know, on the state you know, totally of, of greenhouse gas emissions um, and not so concerned with attribution. So <clears throat> to me, that's just another consideration, but it's an, an increasingly important one in any discussions of this framework. So just would suggest that that be included in the conversation so that we make sure that whatever Empower does is nested within a framework of the state's overall greenhouse gas reduction goals and targets. All right, thank you, ma'am. Dan. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. I just want to make sure that we have some ability to stop programs if their net to gross ratio drops below a certain level. I mean, if we're down to 20%, you know, 80% of the program costs are going for actions that aren't attributable to the program. That's leading to the surcharge increase. So I'm slightly concerned that we set a, a large gross goal and then we're not able to adjust programs in the future because if we take away a program they won't ever the utilities won't be able to make that goal now i get it maybe we could put something in there about maybe if we need to look at adjusting goals which i don't think anyone necessarily wants to adjust goals but it's just this this issue with the program costs and the surcharge recovery with spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on programs that while achieving these savings are not really you know customers would be doing some of this uh, to buy some of these products without the incentive from Empower. Thanks, Dan. All right. Um, so I, I guess my question is, where does this leave us? Um, and, and I know we had uh, the settlement. I know we're kind of revisiting uh, one issue with that and it doesn't look like there's going to be any agreement, at least as of right now. Um, and if there isn't, I guess it's up to the utilities if they want to essentially pull out of the um, all the other issues that were agreed upon in that part of the settlement. That was a question, if anybody didn't get that. Judge McLean, yes, may, I, may I respond to you? This is Lindsay North from PHI. Please, yeah, I'm just hoping somebody. <laughs> I, I think, um, is that what people are asking? Is that they want to reopen this discussion specifically? And I know that you are just repeating what you're hearing, but I, I just wanted to pose that to the group if that is, if that is the ask. I think it's it's just this the net versus gross, um, but I, I was just kind of putting it, you know, I guess as as a a bigger picture uh, based on Lori's uh, comments that this was just one of multiple issues in the settlement. And if this one goes away, then maybe the rest would, uh, would the, the other agreements in that partial settlement would go away as well. Right. So just to follow up on that, is that what other, okay. is that the intention that other parties have by bringing this up is that they want to reopen? Because um, I, I don't want to answer that question if that's not really what people are hoping to to do in bringing this topic up. And I hope that's not the case, but I understand if it is. Mr. Gravatt. Thank you, Your Honor. Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Advocates. And I don't, I, I didn't hear Joe and staff or OPC or our position as we want to reopen all of the issues in that agreement. I think uh, the question was, you know, we've been given this some more thought and we think that is a better approach. And I think the utilities have said, well, we're not going to talk about that unless we reopen the whole agreement. Um, so, uh, so that's a response and that I think that's accurate, right? The, the utilities response is we don't want to talk about net to growth as a standalone issue having come to th that agreement. So um, yeah, go ahead and if you want to respond. I'm sorry, Jim, I, I didn't want to interrupt you. 
please, please finish your thought. <laughs> well, I was going to say, well, so if that's accurate, if that's a utilities position, um, we're only going to discuss this in the context of the entire agreement that we came up with. Um, one option I could see, Your Honor, is, you know, referencing the agreement in the report, saying this is discussed, um, and we could, in follow-up comments, uh, individually say, you know, yeah, we agreed to that. We felt that new information suggested that net is a better metric and that's our position. You know, I think that could be one option. I, I personally, I, I don't have that much appetite for reopening the, the entire discussion. I'm a little disappointed that the utilities are only going to look at it that way. Um, but, you know, I guess that's my position. And again, I was just paraphrasing what Laurie said. I'm not wasn't saying that that's what the utilities were intending to do. Uh, Nicole, go ahead, Laurie. I think you were definitely going to open it, but that it's non-severable. So then we would need to look at it to see if there was something that, and it's not necessarily every item, but it could be that I think we would need to look at it. And other parties um, would need to look at that as well. That might have an issue with that you compromise significantly on A and you want to revisit that or if net to gross changes does that change something else that we would do to by changing a does that change how we feel about b so i'm not saying that we are definitely going to and that we're trying to be um lying in the sand but it gives us the opportunity if if a can be open if it can be open because of a and change that the utilities and other parties can look at it to see where we are on b and what that does for them Okay, and that and that's fair, Lori. I I understand. Uh, Nicole, thank you, Your Honor. Nicole Zanger on behalf of OPC. Um, I guess how long would the utilities need to determine whether that's going to be the case? So we we have, you know, I guess good information going into this. Is it possible that by next week the utilities will have time to look at this agreement and see whether they you would want to change other parts of it? That's something I don't really know. I'd leave it, Lindsay, thank you. Um, Lindsay North from PHI. Uh, Nicole, we can take that back. I, I will say that we we have a lot on our plates um, working on cost recovery and PIMS and, that, and that's been where our efforts have been focused. So, and, and that's sucking up a lot of air in the room. I think we're, we're happy to take that back um, and, and take a look at it. But I just wanna acknowledge that that, that, that is something that we're we're dedicating the majority of our efforts to it this time. Thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in? All right. I guess if we if we can't reach a compromise, um, then uh, yes, Joe. Because I uh, I feel your pain, Judge. Uh, I. Uh, what, how about, uh, I don't want to get in the middle of kind of negotiation or whatever, but how about if I uh, work on a kind of template or suggestions for how reporting could be included to make the net to gross issue more transparent in semi-annual reporting as well as evaluation verification reporting so that you know per to dan's concern that if the uh if the net to gross ratios are low we're just at, we're at least making it clear right and that you got five percent or ten percent or whatever uh including at measure level where appropriate and we can also provide additional context because it's not necessarily the case that a low net to gross means you should shut down a program um it could still be cost effective for uh you know, for cust for utilities, even uh, under the utility test. So I could do that, but only if, well, I, I guess I'm kind of, I'm judge, I'm kind of not sure I should be offering that given that it seems like it's a negotiation and I don't want to assume compromise before, you know, somebody else beats somebody else over the head or something. Right. And, and that would be removing the, I guess what you had suggested before moving the, keeping it as a, a a gross uh, measurement 
as we as was originally agreed upon and just essentially yeah. okay yeah and i frankly i think either way uh we should probably amp up the reporting on net to gross um if you have a net goal you want to explain you know you want to provide context around that and if you don't have a net goal uh we should uh provide context around that so uh so but i think it might maybe it might help ease concerns it would ease it would help ease my concerns to know that at least the commission every hearing is getting a report you know on net savings and uh is at least and other stakeholders and at least they're fully informed about what's going on even if they're not even if it's not part of the goal okay all right thank you sir uh jim thank you your honor jim gravatt on behalf of the energy advocates and you know joe i think that's a great idea to <clears throat> think about um more information in the reporting but on this particular issue i, I think nicole's question is spot on uh, and I appreciate Lindsay you being willing to go back and think about that, because again, if you can say for us, if we are talking about a net target instead of a growth target, these are the things that could be affected. That that would be really helpful information to know. Thank you. Is that the kind of information that? Uh, the utilities could provide in in a timely manner. Lindsay North from PHI here. Um, Jim, if you want to send that over email and we could take a look at it, um, I'm happy to have a discussion and we've got some planned discussions over the next couple of days where we can try and stick up on this issue and get back to you. So I'll commit to, to getting back to you. And I think that's a fair, a fair thing that we should do. Um, but I do just want to continue to acknowledge that we've got this massive issue that we're trying to, to work on around cost recovery and PIMS. And so um, we're trying to dedicate as much resources to that piece. Um, and, and that's part of the reason uh, we uh, have stated what we've said, which is that, you know, we already had a discussion about this topic in the, the context of, of the goal structure. Um, and so it's not that we don't want to talk about it. It's just, we already did talk about it and, um, you know, we're trying to dedicate our efforts to the areas where, um, folks have asked us to focus on. If I can just ask for a clarification, I, I think I heard you say if I could send something over, but I'm not sure I had offered to send something over. So I'm confused. <laughs> Sorry. You, you had asked to say, I think you asked a, a question about what, what we would be willing to respond to. And so uh, I was just asking question, if you could put that in writing and send it to us so that we could look I, at it. I, I was I was just trying to paraphrase the question that Nicole asked. I think you know what what I think the utilities have said is if we're going to talk about net versus gross, we might want to talk about some of the other issues. And Nicole asked, "Is that true? And what would the other issues be?" At least that's what I heard. So I was just restating her question and agreeing with it. Does that make sense? Yes. To which I, I think I said we'll we'll take it back and look at it and try and get back to you all as soon as we can. Okay. Exactly. So do you need me to send you something in writing or, or are we good? I don't I don't think so. I, I I'm okay. sorry I misunderstood. I thought you were asking something different. I apologize. No. I, I apologize if I wasn't clear. Thank you. I probably didn't help the matter either. So all right. Uh yeah, and if and if there is a dramatic change uh in terms of you know the settlement uh on that particular on those particular issues um you know if the utilities could provide something you know a couple of days in advance of the uh of our next meeting that would be uh, a huge help to to everyone all right um i guess we can move on from that um unless anyone else wants to beat the dead horse a little bit more all right uh, Dr. Kowalja's analysis. Um, I know uh, folks wanted. Uh, yes, Dr. Kowalja. Oh, I'm just I'm just here ready to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> question. Uh, I want to also just quickly say that I had used an average of uh, for the surcharge, and Jim has since given me the specific surcharges by utility. So the numbers have changed slightly, but but not a lot. Okay. 
All right. Um, so uh, I trust everyone's had an opportunity to to look at some of the numbers um, uh, regarding Mr. Uh, or Dr. Qualja's analysis. Um, does anybody have any further questions or comments on it? I know Jim, you said you had wanted some more time with it. Indeed. Thank you, Your Honor. Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Advocates. I'm trying to cram that into as few seconds as I possibly can. Pretty soon it will become utterly incomprehensible. Um, uh, and first of all, I really want to thank Sammy and uh, CHCD for making these data available and for digging into them a little bit. I think it's, it's uh, just so helpful. And, um, and of course, as usually is the case when someone provides interesting data, what you end up with is a lot more questions instead of answers right off. Um, so we did have a chance to talk about the data with uh, with Sammy and the DHCD staff yesterday and some of you know my initial observations and <clears throat> what I what I think they tell us is there could be some real issues with how the surcharge affects limited income families in different utility territories and with how they receive services how much they pay in how much they get out and and how many households are paying and not receiving services in a you know quick manner and i know there's activity in the general assembly right now on this issue but so i i think there's nothing that comes out of this that says oh this is the thing that's a, an issue that needs to be solved and here's the solution um the more i look at it the more i'm thinking this needs to be studied more closely probably by uh, an independent party. Um, I think there are potentially a number of ways that could be done. Um, the General Assembly could order a study, the commission could order a study, OPC could commission a study, I think uh, within their, their, I think it's within their purview if, you know, if they are able to, to do that, if their funding is available. Um, and, and you know, I, I think I, I really want to apologize for not seeing this months ago as a potential issue because I know we're down to the wire on the report. Um, where I am is <clears throat> regarding the report, you know, I, I'd be very happy to take a stab at writing a page or something, kind of summarizing, summarizing what I think the potential issues are and, and why it's important for them to be addressed whether that becomes something that gets talked about and reflected in the report or whether that ends up being comments that we file independently in response to the report you know, completely open to that but kind of it's, it's kind of where i'm coming to is that this needs to be looked at more because it's potentially a pretty big issue and sir on on your offer there um i mean if you if you know, I'm happy if you can get something done and, you know, if you want to discuss it more with the work group next week, um, if you're, if you're up for that. Um, I will do, do my absolute best. Okay. All right. Sounds good, sir. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, Nicole. Yes, thank you, Nicole, on behalf of OPC. We actually need some additional time as well. We have started discussing this, but it would help to gather more information and we might be more prepared to talk about it next week as well. Okay. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Anybody else for Dr. Quag? He got up just for us. All right. If I may, sir, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm an evaluation person. I'm a data person. I provide the numbers. I let smart people like yourselves decide what they mean <laughs> and what to do with them. But if I may express an opinion, it's not DHCD, it's just my own opinion. When I looked at the data, the one thing that they said to me, and the data often will talk if you just deal with them right is that uh, what we collect from the low-income customers is below what we put back into the low-income community. We collect about 40 million and we put back about 80 million. So at least pass that test. 
of equity. That seems fine to me. It's still still said to me though that they that they're contributing a significant portion of what they get back. That's not very normal. Normally, the low income programs tend to provide more than what they collect from. I mean, significantly more than what they collect from the communities. But what it said to me more than anything <laughs> is that there's some 600,000 households in Maryland <clears throat> that meet the 250% federal poverty level guideline. And only about five to 10,000 of those, perhaps on a year to year basis, get assistance. So the remaining uh, very large population is contributing 90 to $110 a year towards this fund. And in my opinion, significantly increasing their energy burden. And we, we've talked since the beginning about energy burden but we're impacting a significant number, size of the population negatively on the energy burden side, and we're benefiting a small proportion. That says nothing about this program. The current DHCD program is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. But to me, what it says is that there's something beyond energy efficiency, some form of assistance to the low-income communities that, that is badly needed, that is currently not available. All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, yes, Joe. Yeah, I have a question for you, Sammy. Um, if you were going to equalize the money that, or the, you know, the the money that goes to limited income or the uh, equivalent of money versus the money that they contribute towards the surcharge, um, there's really two ways to do it, right? Or I can think of two ways to do it. One is you just have to really amp up your participation so more of the limited income community is getting benefits from it or you could provide direct payments or something like that are there other ways uh like it wouldn't help to increase the size of the projects or the the cap on the projects or would it would that but it would help the the options yeah absolutely thanks joe i think it, increasing the cap will help those small the small population that is receiving the services and that's that's a good thing too uh but it doesn't help the, the other so you're right the uh there are only a few ways you could help those people that don't participate directly in the program either by making some other programs available to them i think equity in general is usually defined you meet the equity test for a dsm umbrella of programs if uh, everybody in your population has access to something in your program i I think that's kind of a loose, not very well defined goal. So I, I, I tend to not use that. So for a low income community, I think you need something more than just have access to subsidized uh, shower heads. I don't think that's that's good enough. So you're right. The only other way is to provide some other form of assistance, either in the ter term form of uh, uh, bill payment assistance or debt forgiveness or something along those lines, or possibly, I hate to say it, possibly rate design, having a specific low yeah. income rate design. Yeah. And can I, uh, a quick follow up is uh, this was just, these were just DHCD, right? Based on DHCD spending, right? That's you didn't correct. include us. That's, 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 has anybody, I uh, uh, just can't recall, has anybody through the work group process or in this process uh, been able to get any sort of estimate of the amount of program, non DHCD program spending that's going to limited income? through light bulbs or, you know, appliances or Best Buy radios or. I imagine that's such a small proportion, but I will let somebody else take it. All right. If you um, don't know, probably nobody does, but I was, uh, yeah, I didn't know whether we'd gotten that num those numbers. Jim looks like he knows. Well, I don't know specifically, Joe. I don't know that we know the, the cost and the dollars. But the utilities for several years have have been required by the commission to report um, uh, the number of LIHEAP recipients or OHEP recipients who participate in non low income programs. So, you know, a customer who's receiving fuel assistance and gets an appliance rebate through the conventional market based program. And those numbers are extraordinarily low. No surprise to anyone, I'm sure. You know, there are the participation in QHEC is, uh, you know, it's non-trivial. So I, I think there is a, you know, it's a legitimate, que legitimate question, Joe, you know, what the expenses associated with that are, but I don't think anybody's done that math. 
Yeah. And well, I can think of there's some programs, the midstream, so the midstream uh, HVAC where we don't know who the customers are. Uh, yep. and, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, RPP, and then light upstream lighting where I guess those that you, we don't, we haven't gotten any numbers from those or nobody's tried to estimate that yet. Right. No, but, but we do have numbers on the, on the, um, not the midstream programs and stuff, but I mean, so you wouldn't expect that there are a lot of customers who are below 175% of federal property level for the OHEP threshold are going out and buying new appliances <clears throat> and you, whether it's a, you know, midstream or, you know, uh, a downstream program because they don't have the money to do it. So, you know, and that shows in the, in the downstream programs is a participation in any, any program that requires a customer to make some contribution to the cost is minuscule that's what we would expect so we don't know for the downstream the midstream program sorry but it's probably really small seems reasonable thank you sir um julia you had your hand up a while ago and took it down do you get your question answered or yeah thanks your honor i was just going to this is julia friedman with oracle utilities i was also just going to kind of raise the same question that joe just asked so I'm good. Okay, very good. All right. Anybody else on uh, Dr. Kowalja's analysis or his findings on that? All right. All right. So, so are you able to join us next week? Looks like um, you know maybe Jim and OPC might have some more for you. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. The only other, oh, okay. There you go, Julia. Um, Taylor, are you on the call, ma'am? Makes things hard. All right. Hold on. Let me see if I can find what Taylor's response was. there your honor right. yes i just pinged her and she is going to be here in a moment so okay, while you're looking oh, um, I, I, you can look or she can be here in a moment so okay thank you Lindsay. we, we can wait thanks you're welcome Taylor, are you with us? Taylor's here. Taylor, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for thanks for jumping on. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, I just wanted to uh, follow up. I think it was a couple weeks ago we had uh, briefly discussed um, what the 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 planning period for the utilities, um, what that would look like in terms of when the results of the potential study. Uh, was going to come in and, you know, how much time yeah. you know, there was to kind of play with before um, the utilities are going in you know, full throttle and planning. Sure. So when I polled the utilities, um, the general response is about seven months um, from the time of setting the goal structure and to, um, I think, program implementation. So that that was about the general time frame that I got from anyone. Um, if anyone wants to add more to that, please feel free. But that was the time. Okay, so if the if the potential study comes in in November, um, in theory, the utilities would have to start planning by when to have their programs ready to go by 2024. I think um, what has to happen, so yeah, the potential study could come in in November, but the utilities would need, um, I guess, the goal structure to be finalized. So I don't think that the utilities, my understanding is that even not, we wouldn't be pro, pro or planning programs off of the potential study. So say the legislature passes the new goal structure, or the new goal, the commission sets the new goal structure in January, then I'd say from January, seven months from January. Okay. 
All right. So, uh, so in, in short, in other words, there's not a lot of time between the potential study and when the utilities are going to start moving forward on the goal structure on the on their programs. I think that's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Dylan. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dylan Voorhees with VEIC. Um, Taylor, I want to just follow up. Um, uh, you said until program implementation, but I think um, I think that may be not what you meant because the program impl implementation would be January 2024. That's when uh, you're actually implementing. So I think what I heard and what would make what I think it would make more sense is if you if it was seven months between having the goal set and needing to file a plan with the commission is yeah is, that's a correct uh change yes okay thank you and that um that happens um tip, typically that in the last program cycle i think that was happening in in august right so that would that would fit your honor with you know sort of around january to around august is the planning is, is the planning period? Am I getting that right? And and maybe Dan, yeah, I was going to say Dan would, would, would have that. Great. Right. Go ahead, Dan. Dan, Dan Hurley with Curious Staff. So the utilities have to follow their three year plan for the 24 to 27 cycle by September 1st of 2023. So seven months from that point takes you back to February, okay. and hopefully we'll have a goal. And it's probably going to be. It's going to be a tighter window than what we've been using in the past but again we're looking at potential major changes here so um uh, just before i get get off um you're on th think that's very helpful that's a that's not a lot of time for between the potential study to be done and and planning to begin but i feel like if that proceeding can be anticipated and you can and have the sort of proceeding set up to go when the potential study results are in then it is feasible and i also would just point out that um you know i there absolutely agree this is a new goal uh, you know basis a ghg goal and that's that's could result in some important differences in programs but the utilities should substantially benefit from this potential study. We'll will do a lot of the groundwork for identifying, you know, where the savings opportunities are, and that hasn't been done uh, in the last several program cycles. I'm not sure when the last time a full potential study was was done in Maryland. So, I, in in short, I think it is it's a compressed window. All the more reason to get ready for it, but it is it is feasible, um, in, in my view. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dylan. Uh, Joe. I just had a clarifying question. Uh, is the next cycle, is it decided that the work group at least is recommending a 24 through 27 cycle? I think that's what you said, Dan. Well, I, I think, I mean, that was a discussion of whether it should be three years or four years um, way back when. And I don't know that there was a consensus. I know the utilities um, were more of the opinion that it, it could be stretched out to four years with some savings on administrative cost and um, and you know the ability to complete some some programs and things of that nature. Yeah, so I was just getting yeah. uh, clarity on what I thought was still an undecided or what had not been decided. But you're correct, still undecided. Uh, Taylor, I just had a clarifying question for Dylan. Um, Dylan, are you saying? Um, and I apologize because I know I jumped on here um, and you may have clarified this before, but um, are you thinking, so is this in relation to potentially having like another proceeding between like after that potential study, then you have enough time yeah. for that? Is that what yes, you meant? Th this was in, in regards to um, OPC's comments filed a couple of weeks ago that there should be some proceeding and i think nicole yeah. you stated not an adjudicatory proceeding but some kind of proceeding where the commission could take input in addition to the potential study itself that would enable them to give the utilities you know actual goal targets to plan for um and so if that if that was something that was happening in you know again it would be a three or four month window but that that would be feasible but only if you're planning for it ahead of time and not you know getting going 
uh, you know, in October. Right. And I do remember that where we left the conversation was we wanted to make sure that we'd had the results of the potential study before we went into this proceeding just for purposes of, you know, the whole, we're putting a lot of work into this potential study. We want to make sure that we have the actual potential study there. Um, so I think th that was what I think prompted the whole discussion about the timeline. So it yep. sounds like we'd have any type of work group that we have or proceeding that you all are suggesting would start in November. So two, two clarifications, um, Taylor. One is, I mean, my experience, a commission proceeding can take 30 days between when it's initiated and when actually any substance is done. We don't have 30 extra days for calendar setting and procedural stuff. So I would start the the process prior to when you actually have the potential study in in hand. Um, that's maybe a small point, but it 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 literally could be <laughs> you could you could use up a month, um, and I don't think there's sort of time for that. The other point, and we did talk about this a little bit last time, and also with the potential study um, uh, consultants, is the difference between having some basic results and having a final report. And if it and if if there's no actual even results available until November, I think that's very challenging. If the final report is not issued, you know, it's not published until November, but there are, you know, results available in September, then I think you kick things off, you know, in August. And then by the end of September, you're ready to actually do the substantive part of it based on those results. Then I think that's feasible. So there's some of this is some some details, and I don't know if you have more insight into the the results, you know, getting the results versus getting a final report done. Yeah, um, understood your point. Um, I don't have the timeline in front of me, but um, I think that there are a lot there is a level of preliminary data that we will get um i think we just i would i, I don't want to speak out of turn here without um having consulted with the utilities and um their thoughts on that but i i was primarily wanting clarification on your timeline there so that was helpful so just so I can clarify, uh, Dylan, so really your timeline would for further proceeding would have it have to be assuming we wait till the end of the uh, potential study have to be in almost December or like early January. Well, again, I'm I'm sort of hoping and maybe this can feed into the decision making that's happening with the consultants when there was a there was a, the last time I was I was in a meeting as part of the stakeholder process for the potential study there seemed to be a little bit undecided or unclear about whether there could be results available maybe even a month or two months before a final report is due um and if that's the case that would that would that would make a big difference and so i would encourage the utilities to take that back to the consultants and, and work on uh, trying to ensure that that can happen um I think that this the substantive part of this process, including you know commission deliberation, and it probably needs to be three months. So I think it needs to. I think waiting to till you know the end of November is would be challenging, and I just don't think that's necessary. Given my understanding of what the consultants were saying, they they might be able to re release some results. You know, so in, a, in in a perfect world, when would you see like uh, the the hearing being held, whatever kind of hearing it is? Um, I mean, it, it depends a little bit on how long the commission needs. Imagining that the commission might need thirty days to issue an order from a, a hearing, I don't know if that's a realistic number. But if that's the realistic number, then you know before Christmas, you know, you're holding a hearing and that allows them to have till the end of January to issue an order. 
and if there's a hearing in you know say in the middle of december you're wanting people to be able to file comments in november and, and have those comments be based on the, the potential study so again i think it's I think it works if there's some basic results available by october you know that seems to work all right all right thanks dylan appreciate you clarifying that um joe yeah in the uh past a uh, couple cycles at least there's been a program uh, uh new ideas meeting or two and i was wondering if that if there are plans for that and and whether i guess how how that's going to feed into the potential study um because i don't think you'd want to do that after the well you can't do it after the potential study because it'll be too late anyway but or, or or is the expectation that the potential study will somehow will will gather up any groovy new ideas and make sure that they're considered sorry i withdraw my question judge <laughs> sorry uh taylor sorry joe i do not know the answer to that question um one thing that i just am thinking about and going back to when the commission uh considered the rfp for the ghg abatement study there was i know there was some discussion um related to like the language in the rfp but during that conversation um the commission noted that you know whatever additional evidence parties would like to provide to it there would be adequate time or some sort of like way for the the parties to provide that so um I, I kind of like the, you know, and if I'm speaking on a turn to my utility colleagues, please shut me down. But I kind of like the idea of having some sort of hearing in December um, to give the parties time to present whatever evidence, you know, we'll have our potential study and we will have submitted our potential study because I think we're to submit the potential study by November. I know we said, I think we're supposed to get that final potential study report to the commission before Thanksgiving. Um, that's what's sticking in my head. So the commission will have had that report and to some extent, maybe like a call for comments and then having a hearing um, in December um, that may expedite this. And then the commission has time to issue its order in January, early February. That's just kind of off the cuff here, um, my thoughts. So welcome to think through that, but that's what I'm thinking. Thanks, Taylor. Um, yeah, uh, Dan. Yeah, thank you, Dan Hurley, Christian Stout. Um, so uh, can I get a clarifying question on this hearing? Is this hearing to present the actual goals or is it just or is it kind of a combination of reviewing the potential study plus goal recommendation, like the actual goal recommendation, and then also possible program ideas? I'm just trying to get a better handle on, on what it is that this hearing would need is uh, would need to be. I would, and Dylan, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm hopping ahead of you, but I would just, what I can say, Dan, and again, open to discussion, like I said, this is me kind of just thinking through it and talking with the group, but I would say not the program ideas at that hearing because I think we first need to figure out the goal structure and what we're working off there. Um, and then later on down the road, when we've filed to for our new programs for the next program cycle in that um, when we're when we're there, then we'd maybe talk about the program ideas then or the programs that the utilities have put together. Um, so I don't know that program ideas would be included in that this possible end of the year proceeding. Uh, for what it's worth, I agree with that. Um, and I think what OPC was envisioning in in the, in its comments on this would be that it would be focused on the the actual goal amounts so you know how, how many greenhouse gases are or tons of greenhouse gases are we trying to save the other parameters 
that that were you know part of that that goal structure that you'd actually try and be quantifying those and that the commission would say to each utility you know we've looked at the potential study we've heard the comments from other parties we heard the proposal from opc said the goal should be this you know somebody else said the goal should be this and they're deliberating on what those those goals are and i think that i, I agree with taylor i think that's the that's the starting point and, and you you build from there um so that's our that's what we're okay. imagining all right yeah because when we set the two percent goal there was a comment period in a hearing now this was kind of on a different timeline back in the day because i think we actually got into the next program cycle before the next goals were even set so they were yeah. we're kind of in this new i don't want to say paradigm but you know we're kind of shifting things around with with the timing here but yeah i would totally agree with you know presenting parties presenting an actual goal and or list of goals and then having a hearing and having the commission make a decision for us and then moving forward so uh, thanks for that clarification Great. all right thank you dylan taylor dan um we actually kind of agreed on something there um anything else on this issue potential study planning proceedings all right. Well, at least we got one thing done today. Do we need um, to do, a, do we need to do a shot because we have an agreement on St. Patty's Day? Is that is that a rule? <laughs> um, I'll, I'm going to have to wait on that, uh, Mr. Hurley. As you can see, I'm in the office, so I already I'm had that, Dan. I'm good. good. I would wait too. <laughs> All right. Um, so, anything else uh, before we figure out what we're doing for next week? All right, so from what I've got is, so the utilities are gonna respond, provide their responses to all the questions from last week uh, regarding PIMS and cost recovery by the 22nd. So we're gonna talk about that next week. And then we've got um, OPC and MEEA, are going to put something together possibly um, based on Dr. Kowalja's um, analysis. And then we've got uh, hopefully the utilities, um, assuming there's no compromise between now and, and next week on the net versus gross issue, uh, hopefully the utilities can tell us in advance, maybe like a day or two uh, in advance of next week's meeting, whether the settlement that included the net versus gross um, is still going to hold or whether or not there are uh, issues or issues that need to be um, readdressed. Uh, yes, Ken. Kent. Good morning, Judge. Uh, I'm just wondering when that settlement was put together, if everybody was negotiating in good faith? I'm sure that they were, sir. I think this is just an issue where they've um, Joe just wanted to revisit that particular issue based on um, based on what's been discussed since that time. I, I mean, to my knowledge, there's been no issue or no allegation that someone was not negotiating good faith at the time of that settlement. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, all right. Is that anything else? Um, Your Honor, can you um, repeat, you said this uh, at the beginning of the call, but in terms of the next meeting, so we have a meeting next week, and then is that the final or is there a potential meeting on the 31st? I mean, I guess, I guess there's a potential meeting, but what it's doing is it's cutting it into everyone's time to be able to review the report um, before it's filed. Um, I mean, I if we can avoid it, I, I would love to, but, you know, if if the settlement gets if that settlement gets blown up um we may not have a choice but um you know i i i'd prefer not to do that um because it's not only is it cutting into your time but it's also cutting into judge burks and i time to, to review and get something filed but um you yeah. know i i totally understand that i i i i quite quite agree with you I just was trying to get clarity in terms of that I, I you know using <laughs> using that day to instead work on um you know comments and feedback on the draft report mm -hmm. would sounds like a, a good use of time to me so I'm right 
getting closer. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, hopefully the utilities will, you know, the responses will be good. Uh, you know, maybe there'll be something to talk about. Maybe we could just do it in written comments. But uh, but let's let's jump off that bridge when we get to it and see how far we get on the 24th and see what the utilities come back with. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, yes, Scott. Actually, Judge, if you don't mind, I'd like to comment on something that I had said last week. Scott, got his PD, sorry. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring up again solar for low income. Um, Joe reminded me, you know, last week that the whole purpose of this work group is to make recommendations for the commission to consider. And, and solar has not been a part of Empower, but I just wanted to revisit in terms of um, if, if we look at a greenhouse gas goal for low income customers, um, then a greenhouse gas goal is likely to increase uh, low income customers' costs, um, utility costs. And really, the only way we can offset that is with the, the introduction of, of solar. And I, I know in the past, solar has been looked at as a generation system, but if you install it on a, on a customer's home, it's, it, it works equally as an energy efficiency system because it's not requiring the utility to generate electricity to um, provide electricity to the, to the home. And so um, I would just like people to consider or you know, reevaluate whether, whether it's low income or whether it's a whole program. I don't know the answer to that, but at least for low income, you know, reevaluate or reconsider whether solar should actually be an included measure for Empower, because otherwise, if we're looking at going greenhouse gas emissions as a goal, um, we are going to increase the costs on customers, primarily ones that are using gas, um, which is contrary to what we're trying to do with the program is we're, we're trying to reduce their burden, not increase it. And it, it seems the only way we can actually reduce it is to add solar to the program. All right. Uh, thanks, Scott. Anybody want to uh, comment on that? If you want a little time, we can throw that in for next week as well. Go ahead, Dylan. Um, Scott, can you, um, is, is DHCD doing anything with solar currently? Not, I know not to empower, but is there other other programs? So um, we we generally, I mean, so DH, DO, I'm sorry, DUE allows for doing solar, but um, it's it's a very small cost that they allow, um, and so typically it doesn't get done, and it doesn't get done in a lot of states, as far as I know. Um, there is a bill going through um, legislation right now that. Could potentially provide five million dollars a year for multifamily projects only that DHCD would get, but um, other than that, we don't really have any funds that do that. And I'm not I'm not suggesting that Empower alone would be responsible for it, but if we have the ability to do it, if we don't have other funds, we can use the Empower funds to do it. And if we do have other funds, it reduces how much we would need to use for Empower. We just would like to have the ability to do it. Thanks for that. And and I don't know if Tunde is on or anyone else from uh, MEA. Same question, or maybe other parties know. Are there uh, are there low income solar programs outside of Empower that MEA or anyone else is administering currently? This is this is Joe. I could say that there are grants from MEA for installing solar systems, but they're not uh, means based. Yeah. Um, and I'm not aware of means based. Um, I guess um, this is on Tunde from MEA. I guess Joe has answered the question, but yes, MEA has grants for um, solar programs, but no, nothing specific for low no, income. Not Tunde. specifically for low income. Sorry about okay. that. I thought Tunde wasn't here. Thank you. Sure. Um, hey, Scott, Emily asked in the chat if you're able to share whatever analysis DHCD has done on energy burden, any, excuse me, energy burden slash operating cost impacts and the need for solar. So uh, I don't, 
we don't have anything specific, but there have been reports done and, and even Nicole from OPC kind of verified that a couple of weeks ago where if we're doing electrification um, for customers that aren't, so there's two cases. Um, there was a, a study done in, in Colorado that showed um, going from gas to heat pumps increased the the heating cost by um, by eighty percent. This I, I don't I, I haven't seen the study, so I don't know specifically. Um, but that was a study that was done in Colorado, and then a couple of weeks ago, when I had asked Nicole why greenhouse gas and and how would um, not including low income in the greenhouse gas exclude low income customers and and really what the answer is if the more the more we start moving off of gas the higher the cost of gas is going to be for those customers that are remaining on the gas service and so if we're not moving uh, low income customers off of gas onto electric up front they're they're going to be hit with higher utility costs later on but conversely, if we move them to electricity right away, we're also going to up their costs by putting in heat pumps to replace the gas, which increases their, their utility bills. So the only way to actually get the utility bill back down is to add solar to offset those costs of, of changing the, the technology. Thanks, Scott. Uh, hopefully that was helpful, Emily. Uh, yes, Nicole. Um, yes, Nicole Zeitner on behalf of UPC. And what Scott is what Scott has said is is in fact what we're concerned about. We're concerned that the costs of electrification could increase the energy burden on low-income customers if something is not done. Because as he described, as more and more people leave the gas system and move to electric, there's there are customers left on there that will be paying the entire burden of the system. So so yes, so I think I would I can take this back to the office and we would be interested in discussing the solar issue. Uh, Jim. Thank you, Your, Your Honor. Jim Gravatt on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Advocates. And I, I think it's important to point out that the costs on low-income customers are going to go up either way if we don't address something in rates or in some other policy. Because if we leave them on the gas system, the gas costs are going to go up because they're going to be carrying more of the costs of the infrastructure. And if we switch them to electricity without, you know, in situations where their immediate bill costs change because running heat pumps is more expensive, their costs still go up. So they go up either way. So this is going to, I think, require some pretty thoughtful policy consideration of, of how to address these issues. And you know, I think, Scott, the, the renewable energy solar is, is one of the important considerations. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, Joe. Yeah, from the evaluation cost effectiveness world, uh, this is an issue we'll need to deal with uh, for sure. Uh, and I just point out that, you know, baselines are is 90% of what I do every day. Uh, and the baseline in this case, if you have electrical uh, uh, beneficial electrification going on and a move away from the uh, from gas and those gas costs go up, then actually you know we're we're comparing to what would have happened versus what did happen and so uh you know so it could get lost that those uh, uh the program could a, a shift over to heat pumps or to hold the low takes or whatever could look very good because gas prices have gone so high and so it's a it's a tricky issue analytically uh and uh, in terms of you know how we report out cost effectiveness for the programs, in addition to being a policy challenge that people are raising. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nicole. Um, and I just wanted to point out, I'm sure everyone is, has read this, but the buildings transition um, report from the Maryland Commission for Climate Change, Maryland Commission, Commission on Climate Change, specifically says that we should be transitioning all low income rate payers to we should be retrofitting them by 2030 and that's because they're concerned about this issue so there there are some solutions in that report but they still think the residential electrification is the way forward but they do propose retrofits by 2030 so obviously there's a lot to do in a short amount of time thank you thank you uh joe 
Yeah, I'm sorry. And so that so uh, that's exactly the point. If that's uh, if there are other policies or other mechanisms uh, that are driving that switch uh, for low income, uh, then that could be baseline and and Merrill and Empower could not get credit may not get credit for it. And so that will be the that will be the thousand dollar question for the Empower programs. Uh, Dylan and Scott. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Joe, uh, two two things. One, I would distinguish uh, between uh, the the either, whether the legislature does it or it's the Climate Commission. Setting a target is not the same as having a policy that actually has any funding or programmatic elements to it. And I think just <laughs> the state declaring that it would like to hit those targets is is just does not in itself raise raise that concern, uh, but I would agree with you that there is some there are some tr potentially tricky kind of baselining issues around having um, low income participants go to go to solar, and you you might find that uh, TRC or or a societal cost test that you there's there's less benefit to be had there um, because of some of those reasons. But I think that does not necessarily change what Scott's talking about, which is from a participant's point of view, it makes uh, makes a transition more affordable from a, from their own participant bill savings. And I think that is really potentially critical. Um, and that is that is the, the concern that he and, and Nicole and others have raised about transitioning limited income households to you know electrification is it's just not it's just not fair to do it if it results in bill increases so it may be a way to mitigate um bill increases for participants uh even if it's not um dramatically improving or, or even necessarily at all improving um sort of a trc or, or societal um cost effectiveness you buy that yeah, no, I, I follow that except uh, uh, a couple nuances with it. Um, that baseline, I, I uh, if if MDE, for example, in its plan and all that is is laying out uh, things that it's going to do. Maybe it's increased standard. Maybe it's requiring, you know, whatever it's requiring. Then you get into the net you know, this net issue about what is actually can be attributed uh, to the utilities. And that that seems like it's going to be a significant issue in this context. And in terms of the cost effectiveness, ultimately, you know, we've talked about the SIR and uh, quite a bit recently, or I, I and others have with, uh, and why, why is a SIR requirement there? And the only reason I can think of that DOE and weatherization assistance program back in its, you know, uh, when it, back in the early years decided to have a SIR requirement was that they were giving low income direct payment assistance at that time. And everybody's arguing, we'll go do weatherization instead. And so then the question is, well, we want to at least make sure that whatever the, uh, that the, uh, that it would be cheaper to install the insulation and do the air sealing than to just pay the people's bills. So that was kind of, I think that was kind of the, the you know question in the beginning and i think that question comes up here when i think of solar you know a lot of uh i have solar panels and on my house i you know i basically rebuilt the roof and that is often uh the case that you got to go at least, least got to have a good roof under it and uh and when you get into low income situation you got all sorts of ancillary costs and that go along with it and so i'm uh, i'm just i'm positing that in terms of a cost effectiveness uh, of going and installing solar panels or doing the insulation stuff that, you know, uh, it becomes relevant, whether there's a totally cheaper way to do it, um, such as just buy, buy the electricity for them, you know, pay their electric bills. So that's all. And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not giving any answers here. I, I'm just raising questions and things that we'll have to, in the EAG and elsewhere need to, uh, deal with and, come up with policies with respect to. Thank you, sir. Uh, Scott. 
Um, yeah, so um, I guess one of one of my responses um, to one of Joe's or maybe the conversations earlier conversations was um, for low income, you know, we're not looking at cost effective anyway. I mean, sure, it's nice to be able to, to have it, but that's, you know, it's not required by the program. Anything that I'm seeing in legislation going forward, you know, isn't going to also re require it. That that'll say the status quo. Um, so we're not. I don't think we need to look at the cost effectiveness of it. Um, but I, I do think if we're, and I think maybe Dylan had said this, if we're going into somebody's home and we're requiring them to change their system to meet the state's policy the policy is considering what empower is doing and, and the impact that it has on on the state and so um it, i don't think the purpose of the low-income program is to increase customers utility expenses and so whether whether we're able to offset it with with um solar panels or, or something else or maybe it's a it's a subsidy, you know, a direct payment subsidy. Um, you know, maybe that's the case, but um, you know, solar is a, a long-term, a long-term solution um, that'll you know help keep their bill down. It'll it'll help achieve the state's goals. And I agree, there are other costs that may be involved, but that shouldn't prevent the program from allowing it to be done. It, it maybe it should be allowed to be done, but then we have to figure out beyond that, you know. What are those ancillary costs and, and how are those dealt with? All right. Thank you, sir. Anybody else want to weigh on this? All right. All right. So just to recap for next week. Why don't we keep, plan on kicking off with uh, OPC and MEA and anyone else who wants to comment further on Dr. Qual just study. We'll dive into PIMS. We'll do net versus gross, and then we'll uh, finish up with uh, the low income solar issue that Scott uh, raised. Uh, I think it was last week as well as or the week before, and, and this week as well. Anybody else wants to comment on that? All right. Are we missing anything? Jay Z has left the meeting. Yes, Marin. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honor. This is Marin Mahoney on behalf of this series, Energy Optimization Worker. Um, I have a question about the, I guess, I just need some clarity on how much of what we've discussed over the course of the stakeholder process will apply to the current uh, Empower cycle and how much will apply to the, the, the next full Empower cycle. My uh, this my non empower uh, background here. My, my thought would be it wouldn't apply at all to the current uh, cycle, and we're just looking at twenty twenty four and beyond. Joe, okay. I think uh, that the you unless it got changed, and I didn't notice that the utility joint utility OPC agreement on cost effectiveness uh, kicked that question uh, the question for the current cycle over to the EAG uh, and initially I know I'd been hearing you know kind of well, we shouldn't change uh, this cycle but I've had at least rumblings from people uh, that uh, you know even from well just with no with no names at this point but that you know there is receptivity and or support even for it so that's not to say it will happen or whatever it's just to say I think it I that's what I understood it was being kicked to the EAG there have been a number of other issues that have been raised in the work group that have also been kicked over to the EAG that we call uh, corrections or you know uh, uh, you know kind of technical adjustments that were uh, below y'all's radar. Uh, those uh, include, for example, the marginal line losses versus average line loss question, which we're still wrestling with. And so, uh, so there are things that the work group has punted on, uh, and. Uh, but I think the cost effectiveness, it was passed over to the EAG, but maybe uh, Nicole or somebody can clarify that. I maybe may have gotten that wrong. So, so to the extent that anything we've talked about that's getting punted, um, is that going to impact 
Joe, do you think it's that we punted to the EAG? Is that going to impact this current cycle? Yeah, well, that is my, was my understanding was the question about cost effectiveness was whether it should be applied uh, even for 2021, which that program uh, for the 2021 cost effectiveness, which will be uh, completed this fall. I think probably the timing would not work on that at best. It's 2022 and 2023, but, um, uh, but yeah, I, I, as, as I understood it, that was still an open question, but no, Nicole or Dylan or uh, people involved with that joint utility work group. I'm not, no, I, 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 wrong. I, I don't, I think you're, uh, I think you're right, Joe. I think that was left, that left open. I would just for, for Marin, I, I think, would say i'm not aware that there's been other besides and i know it's very important to empower and very important to joe and should be out to all of us but i think that cost the cost effectiveness parameters is the only really thing where we specifically said we might want to consider applying some of this stuff earlier and that should be discussed at the eag i don't i don't feel like we've talked about all, all the other things that this work group is has addressed i would i would i, I agree Honor you, you characterize it, which is we're talking about goals for the future. We're talking about programs for the future, and and so I, I think that's the one exception. Or I agree, or, and I, oh, sorry. yeah, yeah, I agree that it is uh, limited to cost effectiveness, and uh, that that is actually consistent with current policy, where we use quote unquote latest greatest for our cost effectiveness. So when we're calculating savings towards goal. We try to lock a lot of our assumptions down so that we provide certainty to the as much certainty as we can around parameters that are outside the control of the utilities. Um, but for cost effectiveness, we want to, uh, in real time, provide the latest, greatest information to stakeholders in the commission. And so the question then becomes whether these changes that we've made to uh, you know the, the emissions benefits and and other things are considered latest greatest uh, and uh, knowing that the program plans that the utilities produced for the 21 uh, to 23 cycle uh, were based on different assumptions. I hope does that I hope that helps Marin. That that does help. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Joe, I have a, another I guess a follow up question. Do we have a do you have a sense of uh, when the EAG would know um, when the cost effectiveness would be, uh, you know, the cost effectiveness changes might be applied. Yeah, we've had so much going on that I, I haven't. I, I will. Uh, I will start poking on that in the EAG probably in about a month. Uh, and really, for even for the twenty-one cost effectiveness, when we need to know, you know, for that ex post analysis, uh, as long as we have it, you know, a decision made by June really. Uh, then we're, I think we're good. Um, and if we're, if we're not applying, that's if we're applying to 2021, if we're applying to 22 and 23, uh, then we have, you know, a year or more. Okay. So uh, I, so I would say in the EAG, uh, the discussions will be, you know, probably I have a good feel in a, when in six week month or something like that, when I start poking on this in the EAG, I'll get a good feel for whether we have immediate consensus or whether we're going to have you know a slog in terms of getting agreement and but now okay. at this point i really don't know okay thank you so much i really appreciate that thank you ma'am all right anybody else anything we missed today or that we you want to hit next week that i haven't referenced all right hearing none um I will try, or we will try and get you a draft uh, report out. Of, again, a pretty good chunk of uh, of the report um, sometime next week, and hopefully, we'll you guys can get it back to us by the first. Um, and we'll plan on seeing everybody on the twenty fourth. Enjoy your St. Patty's Day. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.